All right, so thanks for um, uh, inviting me to your birthday party. Um, and um, so I'll talk a little bit, I mean, Greg really nicely set the scene, I think, uh, here for or the context in which this project has been happening. And so I'll dig a little bit deeper in, in one aspect of this NOAA omics um, effort that's been going on. Um, so basically how we operate um, or where this, where this project features in is sort of this general idea that drives a lot of people, I think, in, in, when they think about uh, ecosystem dynamics in the system or ecological dynamics um, is sort of, you know, what drives basically interact or yeah, what, what ecological interactions basically determine uh, phytoplankton succession during uh, cyanobacterial hyperfocal blooms in, in the Great Lakes. Um, and I mean, it's a very simplified um, kind of sort of canonical um, uh, succession pattern in the North Temperate Lakes. You know, it's a lot more complicated than this shows, of course. Uh, but so you have these different transitions and there's a dysbiosis in these systems where uh, cyanobacterial species kind of um, uh, grow way too abundant. And, and so what are all the interactions that underpin that that makes, you know, cyanobacteria able to, to do this and have their harmful effects on the system? Um, the general thesis for, for us, like studying uh, in particular microcystis, right, which dominates a lot of uh, the blooms worldwide, um, is that it's this, you know, Greg already highlights, so what you see here is sort of uh, late flat uh, phylogenetic tree of, of different microcystis uh, strains, right, or genomes that were basically from uh, isolated worldwide, including in the Great Lakes. Um, and there's basically, you can sort of see, right, there's all these little branches, all these different clusters of, of uh, microcystis there um, that basically indicate there's tremendous genetic and physiological diversity uh, within this group. Um, and uh, which is sort of really key, we think, for, and has been shown in other organisms too, for its ecological success. Um, yet, you know, traditionally at least, right, it was sort of like, well, this microcyst is there. Okay, there's this much microcyst. And again, as Greg already highlighted with some examples, right, there's things you can't see uh, unless you take uh, sort of this omics lens to start looking at all this diverse that's there. And, and what is there might actually matter, you know, matters for the impacts on the system and uh, for what might happen next. Okay, so in a, in a general traits framework that we kind of look at, we kind of, you know, figuring out the ecological success of an organism, right, and its impact on the system, you know, and here of what is the composition, toxicity, the duration, uh, is a variety of traits that underpin whether how much it grows and how much it dies. Um, and so I'll focus on uh, first on some resource competition traits work that we've been doing, right? So it's basically how can these organisms compete for the limiting nutrients that are there, right? If you can compete better, uh, you're going to win and there's going to be more of you. Um, and so we focus on uh, phosphorus and nitrogen um, since those are quite uh, important as limiting nutrients in these systems. Uh, and so we go sort of from uh, variation in gene content, right? To measuring actually what this translates to in variation in resource traits, right? So you can look at all the beautiful genes, but it actually doesn't tell you very much unless you can link it uh, directly to measured quantified traits, right? This can be toxin levels, for example, but in our case, it's kind of like, okay, how, how much nitrogen and phosphorus do these organisms need to be able to grow? Uh, and then we can sort of make predictions based on these traits, right? And then look at competition experiments, and then you can go back to the environment, of course, and then kind of see the predictions that we make, are these the dynamics, how they play out in the environment, right? And then that data can also actually, and is already being put into models as uh, Greg sort of highlighted to kind of improve based on the parameterization of varieties of, of uh, factors that are key to make these models work well. Okay, I'll zoom in a little bit here, for example, we're comparing uh, one of uh, the strains that, so Greg's lab kind of assembled a whole collection of Lake Erie uh, microcystis um, strains. And then there's a green algae here, some desmosecumanatus. And so we can see, um, so P star, N star, this is from our star theory, which is the idea, what is the minimum concentration at which you get um, growth still of this organism, net growth of the organism, right? And so the lower your R star value, so for P, that means how little P does there have to be for this organism to grow, right? Or, and the same for N. The lower this value is, the more competitive you are. An organism with a lower value than another organism will outcompete that organism. And what you can see here, right, for phosphorus, okay, it's 0.66 for this Lake Erie strain. That's the most competitive one we had for phosphorus. Oops. And it's 0.58 for this green algae, which one of, was one of the least competitive ones that we saw. And so basically this predicts if P is limiting, microcystis will lose. And then for nitrogen, 
right? Uh, there, and, okay, sorry, these are different uh, death rates that you can have imposed, right? The higher the death rate, uh, the higher these values get um, um, because growth rates kind of scales with the amount of nutrients available. Um, and so for nitrogen, you see this like about 14, right? Uh, versus one, so way higher nitrogen needs. So in this case, basically, the prediction from ecological theory is uh, microcystis always loses. And when you do experiments, and we did these under different uh, N to P ratios, right, of 5, 20, and 80, and then at different uh, dilution rates, which is like a, an imposed death rate, basically, right, and the blue is basically microcystis, and the green is the green algae, you can see only at really high N to P and not too high dilution rates, right, is microcystis able to maintain itself, it's never able to outcompete, right, it sucks, really, at competing for resources, uh, particularly in nitrogen. Okay, so good, right? Not, um, um, so that's sort of the outcome from that, but then, okay, that's not really what nature tells us, right? If we look at Lake Erie, it's not like there's a lot of really yummy little green algae there that are you know, moving up the food web. No, we see a lot of microcystis. All right, so we already kind of know the answer thanks to one of our um, people that has uh, been along uh, the ride for these, uh, for Gloral for a long time and has been really invaluable to me when I joined the University of Michigan, really took me under his wing and kind of connected me to the wonderful work that's been going on at Gloral. So I have, I have a lot of gratitude uh, to Hank. Uh, and so Hank was among um, a series of researchers that did a lot of work kind of showing the importance of predation, right, on making these blooms happen, particularly the introduction of zebra and quagga mussels in uh, in this system, okay. Similar, there's a variety of zooplankton species, right, that have been shown uh, where there's also inhibitor inhibitory effects of microcystis that can basically make them not be eaten. All right, so this from plant ecology is called the growth defense trade-off, right, where organisms either, you know, are on a gradient basis from spending a lot of their energy on growing fast, or they spend a lot of energy on defending, right. And so that's what we see with these green algae, they can grow faster, but they don't defend themselves well, they get eaten very easily, versus microcystis, right, which puts a lot of effort in defense. This is a figure from a review that uh, Greg um, uh, spearheaded with a lot of the people in, in the collaborative project involved, right, kind of that, why are we doing this, all this work, looking at isolating all these strains, sequencing the genomes, looking at the environment, is really kind of knowing all the genetic diversity, but also in the lab measuring a whole variety of traits, right, that we can then link to genes and especially start seeing how are these traits linked or, you know, like correlated positively or negatively, right, which trade-offs exist, which links exist, because, okay, we mainly maybe are interested in how much toxin is there, right, but how much toxin is there depends on which strains that can produce a toxin, right, are there, and how much toxin are they able to produce, which depends a lot on all of these other traits that allow it to grow and not die, okay? So you need to kind of have that really framework of measured quantitative traits connected to the genes, right, map, see what you would predict to be the outcome, do it experimentally, verify that, and then look in the field, okay, are these really the traits that matter for these strains to then indeed take over? And the only way we can look in the field is through metagenomics approaches, right, but the only way we could quantify traits is doing the hard work with isolates in the lab. And so it's been incredible with this Noomics project, project uh, that's been funded over the last you know, five years now, going into its sixth, uh, to be able to do all these different levels of this work with a very large collaborative team. Uh, and it's been an absolute joy to work on that. Okay, so we go to defense traits then, right? Because now we've like, okay, sucks at competing, right? But uh, defense, we already know from the literature is important. Right, and I highlighted in the beginning, right, our, our general thesis was also the reason microcystis are successful is because there's all this diversity, right? So we're again zooming in, okay, what's the diversity in these traits, right? We didn't really highlight it in the beginning, the resource competition traits. There's also a lot of variability there within, um, within Lake Erie, a collection of Lake Erie strains, right? Um, and similar, I don't know, this is some kind of automated setting. <laughs> My apologies for that. Um, and uh, so what we were looking at is basically variability in uh, resistance to mussels and to Daphnia as a model uh, zooplankton species. Now, again, this has already been shown that there is variability there. We just tried to expand this now to kind of like for a whole collection of strains from Lake Erie that span a wide range of the genotypic diversity that's there in microcystis, right? Try to determine basically susceptibility to grazing. This is in collaboration with um, 
uh, for the muscle work with, uh, with GLURL, where the variety of experiments were done at larger scale, and then we tried at smaller scale, do more strains. Um, and then, you know, those laboratory experiments kind of then look in mesocosm experiments with field communities, kind of see whether we see similar uh, results, and then trying to link these to particular genes, right, that underpin the traits uh, that we see physiologically. Again, I'm always highlighting the people actually doing the work. I'm the one that can come talk about it, but it's a lot of work of people in the lab. Uh, and I'm highlighting the people in the directly in our lab, but obviously I've already highlighted all the connections that without which this would be impossible. Okay, and so things that we see, we're still, uh, people are in the lab today actually doing an experiment um, with Daphnia. Um, for the muscle experiments, right, you can see basically this red dotted line there. That's the rate at which the green algae that's fed at the same time um, is uh, being consumed. And so you see some microcysts that are eaten just as well as the green algae going down to a bunch that are not eaten at all, right? Um, these are all strains that exist within Lake Erie. Um, and then for Daphnia, um, these rates are a little bit lower, right? Small, small little bugger here. Um, and again, there, right, we can see some that are um, uh, eaten you know, very well, and then some that are not eaten at all. Okay. And some initial data is kind of indicating that there is a trade-off there uh, between defending against the one predator versus the other. We'll see if that, how that pans out when we have the full data. This was a field experiments that we did. This was still when Hank was in the lab um, in 2018-19. Um, and so we're basically kind of looking. So what we see here, uh, it's a bit busy, but um, uh, strains that are sort of on the bottom are uh, more resistant. Strains that are over here are more susceptible. And so again, here on this axis here, um, uh, organisms that are higher up would be, would be more resistant and organisms more down here are more susceptible. Right, and we see, for example, this one that's quite susceptible in our lab experiments is also showing within a community setting to be quite susceptible, right, and vice versa. Uh, it's not perfect concordantly, not, not perfectly corresponding, but it's reasonable. Um, and the ability to do this was basically using leveraging work from uh, led by uh, Anders and Anders Kildall and Laura Wrights in uh, Greg's lab that identified sort of a, fun uh, a functional gene marker gene that could be used to fairly accurately genotype um, microcystis directly in field samples um, without having to do metagenomics, right? So we have a single marker gene and you can have more, much more rapid and low cost assays where you can do hundreds of samples at a time uh, to track which genotypes are present. And so that way we could kind of link these isolates that we have full genomes, know their genotypes to kind of field data. Um, okay, so then finally, um, you know, a variety, there has been a lot of studies out there. It's like, microcystin, that's what does it for the muscles. No, it's not microcystin. And like, you know, always this dichotomy, right? The toxic versus non-toxic has been there for a long time for every single thing under the sun, right? Now, the reality is, of course, we now know that, sure, that's a very important trait, but it's not the thing that explains all, right? There's a lot of other secondary metabolites and toxins that are produced. There's a lot of other stuff there too, thousands of genes, right? Uh, and microcystin is not the thing that does everything. And often it's just a red herring that sort of, you know, masks basically under, underlying variability, right? Which also explains sort of inconsistency in results. It's, micro, it's toxin, toxic strains that don't get eaten. No, it's the non-toxic ones, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, so now that we have this collection of strains from the same system with full genome sequenced, and we have these physiological, these straight data on actually how susceptible is it to being eaten, we can start linking it to genes. And so some, this is work by, uh, by Marvin uh, uh, Lin, uh, uh, in the lab, a new graduate student. And basically he's identified right now that um, most likely anabinopeptin um, seems to be really strongly linked to resistance uh, um, to, to feeding. And there's a couple of reports out there that uh, kind of indicate some similar ideas. Right, and it's not the only explanation, right? But it's definitely some of the most resistant strains are the ones that have these um, uh, these clusters. He's still kind of working to also together with Greg's uh, lab in, in, in nailing it down a little bit more. Um, and then for Daphne, it's, we'll see, right? The results are there quite different. Some of these most resistant strains for mussels are very edible to, depending on which Daphne, we were using a couple of different species and strains. Um, Anyway, so that's really kind of um, where we're trying to identify now, okay, a couple of these other toxins that are there that these organisms produces, right? And understanding what their role are in the ecology. 
which also means once we have really nice marker genes for what makes a susceptible or a resistant uh, gene type of microcystis, right? That means we have now also a much more direct thing we can target at much lower cost and much quicker uh, results, right? Where we can sort of give an assessment of like how susceptible or resistant is this strain. Uh, is the bloom right now to feeding by mussels or by daphnids or by well, water zooplankton. Um, and then, um, um, you know, in my idea is also we really need to kind of start looking at like, well, okay, if we're going to change, for example, we focus our policy on phosphorus only, right? And there's been already several papers out there sort of making a statement like, might have to be a little bit careful. We're going to change the stoichiometry of the lake and more nitrogen. Remember also, right, this organism is reasonably good at competing for phosphorus, it sucks at competing for nitrogen. Only under really high N2P ratios can microcystis hang on to these green algae. It's not the only competition that's happening out there, right? But that's already one thing. And second metabolites, which are modified peptides, very nitrogen rich, right? Are out there, uh, are need a lot of nitrogen to be able to produce them, right? We already see it with toxic, non-toxic phases of the bloom often correspond to nitrogen availability. Well, similarly, you can also start thinking about all these other secondary metabolites that are produced, which also play a role in its defense against grazers, right? And grazing is defense is really important to maintenance of this organism as a dominant organism, right? So changes in stoichiometry might impact this and basically lead actually to conditions that make it a much harder bloom to, to go away. Maybe, maybe not, right? Uh, but this is sort of interesting things. If we start knowing what are actually the genes, the, the, the molecules that are involved in this organism's ecological success in the environment, right? That's going to be really informative to, for like, okay, if we change things, right? What might be the potential outcome? Anyway, so in conclusion, right? Quantification of resource competition traits and predator defense traits uh, to be used in trade variation aware models of Lake Erie, right? So we're already, these data that we're generating, these are really useful to modelers that need, um, that really like this accurate data um, and that are more specific to the system rather than pulling it from different um, uh, sources in the literature. Um, oops. And then, you know, already highlighted microcystis is not a great competitor for nitrogen and phosphorus, right? Um, and the importance of predation based on its ecological success. That's no, nothing new in a way. We kind of already know that. But a really nice thing is here that we have this whole set of uh, isolates from this system um, where we experimentally verified that and have quant uh, quantitative data now. Um, all right, and then finally, this identification of these genes that are, is really important for them moving us forward. Okay, finally, you know, I wanna thank, um, you know, the, the people primarily uh, doing all the work in our lab at the top there, um, including Dylan that was there during the pandemic as the only person in the lab and then kind of, you know, going to, you know, Glural and handing off samples in a, in a basket for Ashley to kind of, you know, analyze nutrients, et cetera. So it's, um, it's been really a mainstay in this program. Um, you know, several of the people in, in Greg's lab also, uh, you know, people at um, uh, Glural, primarily uh, Hank, Regan, and, um, and Paul involved in the muscle experiments. And also several people at Sigler, like Ashley, Casey, and Emma. So, uh, and of course, you know, work wouldn't be happening without the funding. Uh, it's been wonderful uh, collaboration with all the different people in Sigler, uh, especially through the last year's student know project uh, program. Okay, with that, I'll conclude. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, so we actually have a gap in our schedule next, so there's plenty of time for questions. Um, otherwise, there's the next talk is at 1120. Yep. Uh, thank you. Very interesting topic. Uh, uh, based on your theories that uh, Sam Becker is not good at competition for nutrients, but they, uh, they are using the uh, chemicals, toxic chemicals to defense, right? So is it possible uh, when we decrease the nitrogen and uh, phosphorus in the lake, it will uh, let them produce more toxins to, to uh, get the better competition mm -hmm. situation? I remember that there is one paper uh, you guys published in Science last year, 
uh, the decrease of uh, phosphorus will increase the toxic strain. So is it related together or? Yeah, so I'm, okay. yeah, so definitely I think that was, I think Greg and a variety of other people in the room were involved in that one on, on warning of like a, a singular focus on P, right? Reducing phosphorus is gonna lead to higher N to P ratios, which would in theory predict a more toxic bloom uh, because this is what we're already seeing. And so then all these other secondary metabolites, they're similar to microcystin, right? The main toxin we care about in that they are synthesized by these, you know, non-ribosomal um, um, uh, peptide synthesis, you know, cassettes. And so they're very, very nitrogen rich compounds, which is an explanation of why this organism needs so much more nitrogen than a green alga is that it just produces all of these these molecules and so i don't know i think it's a very interesting idea that we want to pursue next is sort of like okay well if we're going to do some simulations here right do we you know playing around with these strains that are susceptible and resistant to, to grazing um do we indeed lead to you know can we actually set up a policy that would basically really select for the organisms that are less you know predation resistant and then you know and also actually they, they need the high n to p ratios to be competitive and they need the high NTP ratios to be able to make the secondary metabolites. So actually much more of a focus on N, I think. I mean, P of course is generally the limiting nutrient, but NTP ratios fluctuate a lot and have a lot of impact on which one of these genotypes are gonna be there and, and how well they can establish. So I think N should be tackled too. But that's my, I mean, I'm not a specialist here, but that's my, based on my data here, yeah. Vincent, uh, as the water's warm, it's likely that, that the balance of the trait growth versus um, focus versus defense will likely change. You you have ideas about which way it's likely to go. With with more heat, yeah. So, more warming of the compound. Yeah, so typically people say like warmer temperatures benefit the cyanos, right? It's, that's clear based also on their optimal temperatures. But so these competition experiments, we did them at 20 degrees. And then we did them at 25 degrees Celsius and at 20 degrees to some extent it was like, okay, yeah, we should probably have done them at higher. We did them at 25 and the outcome was exactly the same, right? If it goes even higher, right? It might be a bit different. I know in Greg's group, they're looking at temperature profiles. And so I think that's definitely a really good point, right? Temperature, you know, we didn't, that's the problem with traits. There's way too many of them uh, all interacting. Uh, but I think pushing it to even higher temperatures um, in principle would benefit the cyanos, but is it microcystis or others? I don't, I don't know. Hey, Vincent. Hey. Uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry yeah. I'm coming out of nowhere. Um, really, really neat stuff. I've been talking with Marvin a lot about some yeah. of the work he's been doing and kind of converged on the similar idea that maybe as nitrogen gets depleted at the end of the season, we see microcystis try to invest in like different types of metabolites, maybe more carbon rich. I guess I'm curious uh, if you know kind of as that, end of season, post-season starts, what are the levels of grazing um, mm. as that nitrogen gets depleted? And is that maybe also what contributes to microcystis um, fitness, like decreasing at the end of there? Or do you think it's just like the competitiveness for nitrogen? Yeah, we should look back at, I mean, because I know there's been a lot of assessments done on grazing at different times of the year. Um, I don't know for the zooplankton, actually like uh, Rao's data would be interesting to kind of look like because he's been doing like grazing experiments throughout also with Hunter. Um, so so I don't know exactly, on, it, it would be great to have all of it. I know the muscles are also negatively affected. I think, you know, by the, you know, the amount of microcystis actually scales down their feeding to some extent from what I, from what I remembered. Um, so yeah, it would be good to kind of look what we have right now, maybe what we still need to add <laughs> on, on knowledge of that. Um, of that data, but then, and then again, also just kind of looking at, you know, to what extent microcystis does or does not get grazed at different times of the year. I mean, there's definitely, there's a lot of data there that also from like Ace Arnelli's work, right? The importance of phosphorus levels, for example, and the edibility of microcystis, which at that point they didn't look at different genotypes. So it's probably a selection for different genotypes. And I have to look back if they looked at the N levels, right? So um, anyway. Good question. I don't really have an answer apart from rambling. 